Today's episode is both heart-wrenching and inspiring. I had the pleasure of sitting down with my friend Margaret. In 2017, at the age of five, Margaret's daughter Caroline was diagnosed with stage four high-risk neuroblastoma, an aggressive cancer that had spread throughout almost her entire body, including her bone marrow. With no signs or symptoms, one day their life was normal, the next day it was not. And that began a very rigorous and aggressive fight to try and rid her body of this awful disease. After 18 months of treatment, she was considered free of disease and went into a two-year trial because of the high rate of return. Before the two years was completed, Caroline relapsed and is still fighting this disease today. In fact, you'll notice the hospital band on Margaret's arm if you're watching. She left the hospital to be here today and then was going straight back afterwards. Margaret and her family have been through so much over the past six years, and a lot of the times we hear the story of the patient going through the cancer, but we don't really hear about the family or the parents of the patient and how it affects them as well. Margaret wanted to share her story and what she and her family have had to go through and overcome with the hopes that it could help others going through the same thing. This conversation unpacked so much, and it was really important for me that Margaret could tell her story in whatever length it took. So without further ado, let's get to it. Here's my conversation with my friend and someone who I am in total awe of. Part one of two, Margaret Lance. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I have my friend Margaret here today with me, and I'm so thankful that you took the time to come. So Margaret is here today, and I have, I don't even know how long have we been friends I was just thinking about that. So I think it's about 10 years, maybe 11. Yeah, I've known you for a long time. And some people, if they have followed me on Instagram, may have seen snippets of your story from a while back. So they yeah. might know some of it or even be following uh, Caroline's page. But I wanted to have you here today because you have really, for lack of a better word, been through the ringer with your family um, and with your sweet daughter, Caroline. So. And uh, Caroline, Margaret's daughter, when she was four, was was diagnosed with stage four neuroblastoma. Yes. And one of the things that you said that I thought was so profound was so often for anybody dealing with an illness, cancer, and then in your case, Caroline, we always hear so much and have so many questions about the patient's story. And we don't focus on the caregiver's story, the family, whether it's the spouse, the parents, the siblings, uh, and the kind of trauma they go through behind the scenes. Uh, And I naively have to say, I probably never gave that much thought until knowing you and kind of hearing your story and your experience. So my goal is that if it helps anybody else going through something like this, then then our work here is done. Yeah, I hope so. There's plenty of caregivers out there, so I don't want anyone to feel alone. And the patient's do have the spotlight, rightfully so, mm-hmm. but it there is such a significant ripple effect on a di- of a diagnosis. And so, I think it's like we know that. Like if we think about it, yeah. we're like, well, of course there is, but you just always think like, no, they're fine. They're just taking care because it doesn't appear that they're the ones going through right. the trauma. And especially if you're um, someone that doesn't, like I just... I'm a naturally quieter person. Mm-hmm. So if if you aren't talking about it, then it's just not really top of mind. So Yeah. So I would love you to start at the beginning and tell us about the day that I say your world really changed forever. And if you can just give us a snapshot of of that day when she was four and kind of walk us through how 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 you came to find all this out. I will, and it definitely delineated uh, before and after, before cancer and after cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's actually a couple days, but the short version of the story is um, two days before Thanksgiving, Mark went to a lunch at Caroline's daycare. It was a great lunch. Um, She went down for, supposed to go down for a nap. She was four years old at the time. I was working full time, so was Mark. Um, And I was working downtown, couldn't make it to the lunch, so he went. Um, got a call from the school that she was crying unconsolably, which was unlike her in general, uh, but she'd been at the daycare since I went back from maternity leave. So they knew her and they knew something wasn't right. So Mark picked her up and took her to, we couldn't get into the pediatrician because it was late in the day. So we took her to the urgent care. They did not feel comfortable with like 
they couldn't find anything quote unquote wrong, but mm -hmm. they were like, she doesn't look right. And she's definitely not acting right. Go across the street to the pediatric ER at Williams Medical Center. Mm -hmm. Did, sorry to interrupt. Did she have like stomach pains? Is that oh, what I'm she sorry, was? Yeah. That's okay. She was crying in pain. Yes. Okay. From her, so but saying her mm -hmm. stomach hurt. Okay. Her back actually. Oh, her so back. she was saying her back hurt, which was super unusual in general to yeah. have back pain. Yeah. And so <clears throat> we weren't, we weren't sure what it was. We went to um, the ER across the street. So luckily we have a lot of options yeah, very close too. to our house. Uh, so we were at Williams Medical Center. They took an x-ray um, and without getting in, into gross detail, we basically thought she was constipated. Mm. So we went um, went home with a regimen that you get when you get a colonoscopy. That's so, what the doctor said after yep. the x-ray. She's so constipated. So the x-ray, there was a visible rock in there. Okay. It was constipation. Um, and so we went home, did the colonoscopy regimen. We were up all night with that. I went back to work the next day. So this is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I got a call from the pediatrician saying, I thought he was calling because he's super sweet. And we had been seeing him since Andrew, since we moved to Nashville. So um, I thought he was just calling to check on us. Mm -hmm. And he, because you always get a report, your primary care physician gets a report when your kids go to the ER. Yeah. So I thought he was calling to check on us. And in fact, he was calling to tell us that they found a mass around her spine. That's what the x-ray showed. That's what the x-ray showed. So I guess, um, and the way that it works, I've have since learned is like it, something will get reviewed initially and then it gets like thoroughly reviewed later. So just to triple check, you know, they have two sets of eyes signing off on it. Um, and in that further review, they did see a mass around her spine. So he wanted us to go to Vanderbilt downtown to Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital. Um, but because the next day was Thanksgiving, they didn't have any appointments until oh. Friday morning. So um, that at was this a, point, is he offering, like when he says it's a mass, I would assume as a mother, you're saying, so what is it? What does that yeah, mean? So he, they, he didn't say much, uh, probably because he hadn't, one, seen the x-ray yeah. himself. Um, two, I also have since learned, like, you just don't want to ever give false hope, mm -hmm. false promises. You don't know what it is just off of an x-ray. But I will say that he already had made the appointment for us. And wow. he was giving me um, directions. I'll never forget this one detail. He was giving me very specific directions on, like, where to park and how to walk in. And I was like, this is, Extreme. like, whoa. He yeah. already made the appointment. We had a, the first appointment. And he's telling me how to walk in like, okay, this can't be good. And at that point, I thought um, that it was a tumor, like that she had the worst case she was going to have to have back surgery right. or something like this. Is she feeling better at this point no, or is she still crying in pain? she was still crying in pain, but they had they had managed it. Like getting relieving her constipation helped for sure, but she was still in pain. Um, and they had just prescribed just regular pain medicine for that. And then- we had a very heavy Thanksgiving, just like, we don't know what it is. Yeah. What could it be? We kept it to ourselves. Only a couple of people knew the people we were having Thanksgiving with and a another neighbor because we needed someone to watch Andrew because mm -hmm. at the time he was only nine and they were out of school. So um, we went to Vanderbilt and we went into the CT scan. Everything's like, it's just very overwhelming if you've yeah. never been in there before. So they're doing the CT scan and then someone pops out of the room and said, is this the first time you're seeing this? And we were like, what? <laughs> so we knew that wasn't good. And Mark and I looked at each other like, yes, slash what? We're like, what? yeah, what are we seeing? <laughs> so I was by her head. So the CT scanner, you know. Oh, so you're body, in the room with her. So, we, so as, as a minor, yeah, you're allowed okay. to be. And actually- I mean, I guess anyone could really be in the room with someone getting a CT scan. Yeah. But yes, you can be in the room. You just have to wear like the metal protector mm -hmm. thing, uh, apron. And Mark could see into the room where the radiologists were. And so I was with Caroline and he could see them Googling our primary care physician. <laughs> so he was like, that's not good. That's not good. Oh. And so they didn't say anything. They just brought us into a room, like a waiting room. We're like, okay, this is not this good. can't be good. It's never really good when they're yeah. just not like, we'll call you with the results. Right. Have a good day. Right. So we're waiting. And then people kept checking on us to make sure we hadn't left. And it was taking a while. And we're like, yeah, we're not going anywhere right. until we find out. Are you out like what's starting happening. to panic a lot Very at this much point? So um, but we also had Caroline with us. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so we're, you know, you're trying to not look panicky yeah. because kids feed off of energy, whether they can feel it. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to be like very calm. We were looking at her iPad or, you know, she was, we had head, she had headphones on and she was in this little tiny kid rocking chair watching an iPad. And we're just like sitting there like nothing's happened. Right. Um, and then the door opened and a team of people came in <clears throat> wow. and the phone rang and it was our primary care physician. So he was the one that gave us the news. On the speakerphone? On speakerphone that it was cancer. Wow. Um, Caroline, luckily, like I said, had headphones on. Um, and I didn't react, which it's so interesting now in hindsight. Um, I really am surprised at how much I guess I used to judge people based on like, oh, they're not reacting right or something. Like <laughs> so, she should be falling to her right, knees like, and crying. Exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. Like I should be in a puddle on the floor. Mm -hmm. And instead something supernatural came over me and we listened and, you know, when we hung up with the primary care physician, the on radiation oncologist came in and um, I, I believe that's who it was. And then again, like I said, there was a team of people that came in and they were talking to us about the plan and what it was. And it's very hard to comprehend. You're just kind of like, wait a second, what? Yeah, Like, are you even listening and yeah, taking it all like in at that point? You can't really. Um, I remember not crying. I remember them explaining to us the roadmap for treatment. I remember us asking like, but this is curable, right? Like we can fix this. And then being like, yeah, we have they, a treatment for it. But they but weren't looking helpful. No, well, they just don't want to ever give false okay. hope. So they're always, always hopeful, always. Um, and we have had an amazing experience there. Um, Caroline's, the the person that has been with her since day one is still her current oncologist and she's amazing. Um, but they never want to give you false hope. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I went to the bathroom to cry, to get a little yeah. bit out. Um, Mark, I remember, he was wearing, he put on sunglasses, so Caroline couldn't see him mm -hmm. crying. Uh, so. Do you say anything to each other no, when you leave the room? No, we left the room at separate times, um, you know, like because Caroline was with us. So I think, you know, kind of he had his moment and then I took a turn going to the restroom and had my moment. I called my sister and um, I called, my sister. And I think I had her call everyone else, mm -hmm. a small group of people. And, and then we left. It wasn't, and it's not like what you think it is. It's like, they tell you, and then they say, come back Monday. And you're like, what? So they just send you home with her. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So they sent us home. Um, and their advice was, uh, don't go online. Don't research this. Mm. Did you anyways? I did not. I actually did not go on. I did not go on the internet. As you know, I don't have social media. Mm -hmm. um, I <laughs> am, the unicorn of the world. I know. I know. I got off in 2016 and That's I really good. It's I good for you. occasionally it's good for you. have regrets, but for the most part, I don't regret <laughs> it. Um, but Mark went on right away. Literally, I drove home mm -hmm. um, because he had actually just had surgery. So he was Oh, that's still, right. I remember yeah. that. So he was yes. in like, a, yeah. he yeah. had um, shoulder surgery. So he was on um, fresh, 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 fresh out of surgery. So he couldn't, he was on pain medicine, couldn't drive. And I drove home while he was researching online and I didn't want to know anything. Yeah. Um, but they, they, you leave um, and then they just say, you know, come back Monday. We'll talk to you about what next steps are and, Yada, yada. But you basically leave. It's like your child has cancer and it's Friday in the weekend and you're like, okay, well, what do we do now? What are we doing like, all weekend? What? Staring at yeah, each other. I mean, and you're just so freaked out and it was a lot. We didn't really talk about it. We cried on the way home quietly because Caroline was still mm -hmm. there, but she did fall asleep in the car. <clears throat> and I, um, I had Mark Google, um, how to tell your child they have cancer. Because how do you tell your child that they have cancer? How do you tell the siblings? I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Do you, like, how much information do you tell them? And, you know, it's just like, you never, it's not something you think about. No, um, that's not what you've been thinking they that week. No, and even like I said, even in my brain, my worst case scenario, quote unquote, um, was that she was gonna have to have back surgery. So this was right. like a whole new, not even on the radar that it what was What was cancer. the treatment they had prepared you to come in for? 
Uh, very long. Um, they told us it was about 18 months. It would be five rounds of chemo. And her treatment plan did did go exactly as they had mapped out. Um, it was five rounds of chemotherapy followed by, um, oh, five rounds of chemotherapy. Then she had her tumor resection. Then she had two stem cell transplants, um, 20 rounds of proton therapy, and then she had six rounds of immunotherapy. So that stretched out over an 18-month period. So we did know going into the weekend, here's the plan, here's the diagnosis, um, you know, we offer all of these things at our hospital, but you do have choices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone usually thinks automatically pediatric cancer, St. Jude, that like all pediatric cancer patients go to St. Jude. But um, the reality is, is pediatric cancer is very rare and children's hospitals work together so that they can offer standard treatment plans. Um, so not for relapses, but for traditional, you know, if it's, if it's a standard treatment, like I just said, um, they offer it most likely at your local children's hospital. Okay. <clears throat> so how so, did you, did you, did you tell her that weekend? I don't even know if you, you told, told her, her that day. You told her that so day. So we got home. Cause she's four and she that's was a, four. that's a weird age. Cause it's like, Almost a toddler. Yes. Not quite, like a four is a hard, hard age to, did she, how, or how, do you Not, want to share how you did oh tell no, her? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so she fell asleep on the way home and our son was at our neighbor's house. Um, so I, we had, my sister called our neighbor to tell her what was going on and that we just needed a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Like we were going to leave him there a little bit longer yeah. so that we could kind of get our ducks in a row. We put her in bed to finish her nap. Thank goodness she fell asleep. Then we melted down into puddles <sighs> on the bed in the yeah. bedroom floor. Like I just remember, s s I'm crying. It's all right. I just remember s sobbing on the floor. We both were, um, and it's like we had that really intense moment that you mm -hmm. think you would have immediately, right. but it was like a little bit delayed. Delayed. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's almost like you <clears throat> kept it together for yes. her. Yes. And then when you knew she was not going to see you. Yeah. You have your moment. Yeah. And you do him. that the whole, I, that was a common thread throughout all, all the 18 months she was in treatment because, you know, like I said in the beginning of the story, kids feed off of your energy. Mm -hmm. They know without you saying, you know, I didn't ever want her to feel that fear, mm -hmm. you know, that we had um, and that panic. So we had our moment, we collected ourselves. We decided that we were going to tell Andrew first and then tell Caroline, we were going to tell them that day. And also because it was going to change everything. Yeah, uh, I wasn't, we had, you know, because of the treatment plan, I wasn't able to go back to work. So did um, you know like that day, I'm going to have to quit my job? Like, did you I think knew that? based on her diagnosis that this, I might not have a lot of time with her. Mm. So whatever time I had, I was like over my dead body. Did you, well, I did you not spending it with her. <laughs> did you feel like that because of what the doctor said or because of what you market Google? Um, both. Okay. Because I think that although they, like I said, are very hopeful, they also give you a realistic prognosis. Mm. They could tell without needing to do any further testing that she was stage four. She's advanced mm. stage cancer. Um, ne neuroblastoma is typically a uh, you know, a baby cancer. So mm -hmm. it's more common in babies. So she was old to get it at four. She was old to get yeah. this type of cancer. Um, and because it was so far advanced and her tumor was huge, it was um, encompassing her whole torso, if you can think of like an octopus shape. So that's why she was actually constipated because it was wrapped around her colon. Mm. Um, it was wrapped around her spine. It was wrapped around her organs, her aor Like it was everywhere. So they, we knew... We knew as well as we could comprehend that it wasn't good. Yeah. Um, and based on the length of treatment and the roadmap and their, um, you know, they did spend a lot of time with us talking about those things. I knew that if this was all the time I was going to get with her, I work, I'll figure that out yeah. later. Um, and luckily we were in a position where we could just have the one income. Um, so Mark was able to continue working and I just knew that was my new job. That was your was new gonna, job. My new job was to make sure she got everything she needed, the best care possible, every appointment, whatever she needed. It was, that was my new job. Yeah. Well, and I remember finding out and just thinking like, I just saw her. She yeah. looks fine. Like, yes. what do you, like, what we happened this no be? indication. So that's what I was going to ask you, because I'm sure Truly. there will be people who listen to this 
and think either A, well, surely I would be able to tell. Yeah. Or B, think, well, so in hindsight, was there any symptoms or signs that maybe were this and you thought were something else? Or was it no. truly just it was, she was fine until she wasn't? She was truly fine until she wasn't oh. to the extent that it was almost four weeks to the day that she was diagnosed that she had just had her annual visit, like a very thorough well check. <sighs> So um, now they don't do blood work on four-year-olds. Right. Um, and actually, I don't even know if the blood work would have necessarily showed everything because it's a solid tumor cancer, yeah. not a blood cancer. But um, no, she looked great. She was doing, you know, gymnastics. She was at the, I remember. At the Tybo gym. I like she she was going to daycare. She was doing all the things. And so, no, she was, she was just finishing up her soccer season. Literally no indication. Came out of left field, not on our radar. Totally shocked. So how did she react when you told her? Um, I don't really think she knew what it meant. Yeah. Had you um, even known, had she known what the word meant? She knew cancer loosely because both my sister and sister-in-law battled breast mm -hmm. cancer. Um, but you know, they only knew it as like aunt Joanna, aunt Lauren, you know, didn't have cancer. They were sick, kind of that thing. Now, Andrew, when we told him, he knew more. He just said, um, "I and I, I'm not. An, I don't know if I'm blurring the story together when we we told them if she said it or if he said it. But I, I'm pretty sure he asked if she was going to die, and we said, mm. you know, we're going to do. Our answer was we're going to do everything, and the doctors are going to do everything that we can so to help her live. You know, um, because that's also a reality that comes with this is you don't want to give your kids." False hope. You don't want to say no. She's definitely she's not going to die. Did Caroline ever ask that, or was she, she too did. little? She, she did. She did ask um, when she was. She I think she might have asked like once yeah. when she was. You know, the first time around, the second time around was definitely different. But Andrew kind of was like, okay, and then he said, "I feel like you'll appreciate this." <laughs> what? Then he goes, "Okay, can I go back to Zion's house and play with yeah. slime?" <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it like, sounds completely appropriate for like, a nine-year-old boy. Okay, can I go well, I back to play with my friends? I think that's processing it, too. Yes. They don't, like, especially as a boy, they don't want to sit and break down or look, whatever. No. It's just, like, divert, divert, yes. and think about something else. Yes, yeah. and my friend Jacqueline told me later um, when he went back to her house, because we were like, okay, yeah. sure, like, I guess if you want to go play <laughs> slime, okay. Not what I was expecting, but sure. Uh, she said that he did come in and just say, my sister has cancer and then went back to playing with slime. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and she could tell that he was processing yeah. it and thinking about it, you know, and then eventually like lots of questions come yes. out and, you know, you do learn how to talk to them about it. And there are child life specialists at the hospital and, um, you know, psychologists that will help walk your family through mm -hmm. it. But on that day, that was just very interesting that it was like, okay, uh, so here we go. Here we go. And we did want to tell them that day though, because you know we don't have family in town. So family was mm -hmm. planning on coming in. Um, we knew that we would need support, but we didn't know what we would need. Mm -hmm. um, we knew we had to go back to the doctor's office on Monday. And then on Monday, we'd find out kind of like what our life looks like from yeah. there. Um, and because it was so advanced, they wanted to start treatment as soon as possible. So did they start right on that Monday? They started on Wednesday. So You got into the hospital mm -hmm. Monday. Yep. And she had her port placed surgically um, and then started chemo, I believe that night or the next day. So we were inpatient for, I think, 10 days that stay. Were you sleeping there the whole time? Yep. Were you I slept there off? the whole okay. time. We didn't trade off. So that that is what Mark's, Mark spent the night there before a couple of times. But um, one of the things that, you know, we knew it I'm trying to think like, it, I don't remember exactly the, how we delineated it, but we knew that that was going to be my, my job mm -hmm. and his job was going to basically be everything else. Because if you think about it, he has to still maintain life, right? Mm -hmm. Like work and Andrew, who was nine and in sports and yeah. school, and we have a dog and a house and yeah. life does not stop mm -hmm. because you get this diagnosis. So he was going to keep this life going. And then I was going to have this cancer life over here. Um, but Thankfully, we live close. Yeah. So he's there all every day, uh, as much of the day as he can be. And in the beginning, back um, pre-COVID, when we could have visitors, yeah. 
I mean, visit could you imagine siblings? this had been during COVID? No. And I do know some people that walked through this during COVID. And I truly can't imagine yeah. not having that support um, because, you know, plenty of nights we had family dinner in the hospital mm-hmm. and, you know, we spent we spent holidays there. Her, We spent the first year when she was diagnosed, we were there for Christmas. Uh, we were yeah. also there for New Year's. Yeah. We spent, I think, two or three New Year's um, at the hospital and Thanksgiving, you know, so it became, you know, very, you know, Andrew got very comfortable there. Um, he didn't really care to go. Um, Probably not. But yeah. it was important. <laughs> but he went. Yeah, he went. It was important for me. And so neuroblastoma, is, the treatment protocol is uh, inpatient. So pediatric cancer treatment protocols are all very different. And some are, you know, similar to what you think of traditional infusion centers. You go in for the day or for a couple hours and then you leave. But for what for the type of treatment she gets, it's all inpatient. So the first time around, she did about 160 nights at Vanderbilt throughout the 18 months. Um, and then we were in Cincinnati for a month getting um, proton therapy. Yeah. So yeah, I just, a lot of nights. During the first, I mean, I'm sure it was something that kind of became your routine and became automatic, but those first, the first week or the first two weeks when you're sleeping at the hospital and she's getting all this stuff you've never seen before and whether it's, things put in her or treatments or needles, or she's getting sick from the side effects. I mean, just as a mom, you know, I said this to you and I'm like, I just, you can't imagine. And you probably never thought you would be able to imagine. I mean, no. what is, and, and at I didn't night know, when like, you're alone, I mean, what is, what do you, how are you just making it through those first couple of weeks? I... I don't remember the month of December, to be completely honest with you. I remember bits and pieces. I think Mm -hmm. that's the one way that my brain is protected. I think that's one of the ways your brain protects you. Um, You do have this, as a a mom in anything that you would be fight or flight for your Mm -hmm. child, uh, you, something just comes over you yeah. and you do what you need. That's how I, I'm convinced it's like how people can lift a car or right. something. Like if your child needs you, you ju- it's just comes out of you somehow. Um, but my memories from that first stay were I couldn't believe that chemo like poison was dripping in her body. Mm-hmm. I, I just couldn't believe that we were there. It felt very surreal. It felt like I was living outside of my body. Yeah. Um, I remember not being able to work uh, because she was so little, they have a couch that pulls out to a bed, but mm-hmm. it's, you know, I'd say maybe like six or seven, it depends on the room, but mm-hmm. you know, it's a couple, it's further away from the bed. Yeah. So I slept in a chair next to her, but I didn't know the chair pulled out oh. to also be oh, a bed. So you just so slept I sitting up in the chair. Slept in a chair for the first couple oh. nights, like sitting next to her. And then my sister came to it and she's like, you know, you can pull that out. And I was like, nope, didn't know that. So, you know, um, I think that I was truly stunned and shocked and trying to absorb, you know, I thought I was a very smart person going into this, but I'm not a doctor. No, trying to understand what they're saying. Yeah. I had no idea. Were they good at always kind of uh, kind of giving you progress updates. Amazing at it. So, um, one, they're good at walking you through things in general so Mm -hmm. that, you know, they, like I said, have these child life specialists that are literally certified to speak to children, uh, which is actually great for adults because if you've never encountered this type of, you know, cancer before, or, you know, if you don't know what a port is or what type of chemotherapy or the Mm -hmm. side effects, like they, speak to the children. And so we have the advantage as parents. And I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, because there's- And there's more like the child. layman's terms. So you can understand. No, totally. Yeah. Um, but n- every day they have rounds. Um, so the doctors go to come to your room every morning. Mm-hmm. So there's, it's the same thing every day. A nurse practitioner checks your child when they first get in in the morning mm-hmm. and then um, they'll present to the, and Vanderbilt's a teaching hospital. Mm-hmm. So there's always a combination of fellows, residents. Um, so they come, they used to come into your room. Now they stand on the outside, but they used to come into your room. They kind of stand around the bed and it's, like I said, called rounds. And they talk about everything about her, what's happening that day, what's happened so far, what do we have, you know, to expect for the rest of the inpatient cycle. Um, so we always, they had, they had just launched an app when she started. So, um, we get her lab results right to the app right away. And in the beginning, we didn't so really know like like you what were, to look for, yeah. but I, we had access. That's good. Um, and yeah, so we always felt, and I, always felt comfortable asking questions. And the nurses um, were 
probably in the beginning our greatest resource mm-hmm. because they're with you for 12 hours of your day. They're like your new fa- they're yeah. your new family. And the, yeah. They well, become your friends and your family, so. Speaking of, I mean, because we were saying we wanted to talk about how the family or the spouse or the parents I mean, and I remember asking you this in the past, you know, Caroline is obviously going through all of this stuff and you as the mother are then going through your own thing. But I've often thought about this too, like just in my own marriage, if something happened to one of our kids, it's like when you're in a relationship with someone and something, the most awful thing you can ever imagine happens, the first person you would turn to for support to lean on, for to to help you get through it would be your spouse, most yes. likely. Yes. And when it's like you're both going through the exact same feelings and trauma and you turn to look at each other for support, but then you're like, wait, I can't support you because I'm equally going through it. Like, were you able to do that? Or how do you, who, who do you go to when that, that's just something I've always kind of wondered how people do. Yes, uh, that is an excellent question. Um, And we got some very good advice the first weekend she was diagnosed before we went into that appointment on Monday. We were connected with a family um, through a friend, the Jackson family, who were, I believe at that point, they were like 18 years past their Mm -hmm. child's um, cancer experience. um, And he was healthy and good, but they gave us the best advice that I would give to any couple going through this, like, yes, you lean on each other. Um, you still lean on each other. Mm-hmm. He is still my person. He's still my rock. Um, but luckily at that point, we've been together 15 ish years. Yeah. And so I'm a huge advocate for marriage counseling in yeah. general, just to maintain. <laughs> yeah. So luckily we had a lot of tools in our toolbox about communication. And we already knew that we processed things differently. But I think that the uh, advice that we were given was remember people process things differently mm-hmm. and grace and space, mm-hmm. you for know, each other. like, yes, like you make have grace for each other. You're both going through it, mm-hmm. you know, give each other the space to feel your feelings, um, you know, be, be honest with where you are, you know, like, uh, ask Mark, Mark, Mark will ask me and say, are you okay? And, and sometimes I'm like, no, I'm not okay. And I'll say what's wrong. And it's, and all I needed is for him to just hear yeah. that space. And sometimes I need more and I'll tell mm-hmm. him, or he needs this or that. Um, and we definitely, you know, have our friends that we can confide into, but, but he, we're each other's people. He is my person. And I think that when we're, when we were going through that, especially in the beginning, um, it was a lot of tripping and falling. Luckily, I we we like grabbed each other because I the statistics for uh, kids with chronic illness or terminal illness or any kind of serious illness like this, it's not great. But again, you know, we just I didn't ever want to go online and look at the statistics, yeah. but it puts a huge strain on your marriage and on your family. Um, did you guys ever, like, did you ever allow yourselves to have those conversations of like, what if, like, did, did any of that ever happen or were you just more like, that was, we're just in the moment, in the moment. That's all we can focus on. The only fight I recall having in the last five and a half years throughout this, because I wanted, I wanted to talk about what if, Mm. and he didn't want to go there. He's like, Nope, she's beating this. We're going to get to the end. We just need to get to this clinical trial. She's going to beat this. Like he, and I think he probably, I don't want to speak for him, but I think if he was there, he'd still say say that (laughs) same thing today. Like he's just like, yeah, Nope, she's going to beat this. We're good. We're good. And I'm like, you're being more of a realist. Yes. And I think just that's also my personality. I was in operations until I became a caregiver full time in logistics and I'm a planner. And I'm like, well, I know that if, you know, the worst thing happens, worst thing happens, I I want to, I'm going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know what I'm going to do because I don't want to have to think about it when Mm -hmm. that happens, if that happens. Um, So I want to plan for that. And he's like, no, absolutely not. We're not planning for that. We're not even going to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. But and you had to give him his 
space and grace mm-hmm. to feel that way. And and it's hard. I'm not going to like, I don't want to sit here and be like, oh, we were so great at yeah, it. I like know. we're so gracious with each other. But it is something I've just always wanted because I've always thought that like as a yeah. couple, because it's your both, it's your greatest fear as a mom and dad. It, and yeah. to have to go through and support each other. And there is there is nothing worse. And unfortunately, we know families who have walked that um, mm-hmm. And there's not even a word for it in the English language mm. uh, when your child dies. You know, if your yeah. spouse dies, you're a widow. And I know yeah. this is like, um, I, it's a cliche out there. So I know that people are probably familiar with it, but there's a word if your spouse dies, there's a word if your parents die, mm-hmm. you're an orphan. There is no word if your child mm-hmm. dies. It is the absolute worst. And there's just nothing to say more about it than it's the absolute worst. Yeah. Um, and so... Yeah, you're you're pro- you're trying to go through your own processing and holding it in while also as a mother I'm concerned for my child my yeah. other child who doesn't have cancer yeah. who was used to having his mom around and every gone. day and now mm-hmm. she's gone for a week at a time every time Caroline was in the hospital and also preoccupied you know um mm-hmm. so you're trying to make sure this child's okay and this child's okay and you're okay and your husband's okay and then you have all these you know family members that want to help and and you're like i don't know i don't i don't know what i need yeah. you know you're kind of frozen in this were you getting any sort of therapy during that 18 months when she was in the hospital oh, yes you were um, okay like i said i'm a huge advocate for therapy in general so i i had my own therapist mm-hmm. um I, at the time, was using Talkspace, which was great because um, I could talk. I could do the therapy when she was in treatment, Mm -hmm. which was great. Um, And we saw our marriage counselor when we could squeeze it in. And we had been with her for, I think, at that point, like eight years. So she knew us well. Um, Do you think that helped get through? 100%. I'm not really sure how people get through it without talking Mm -hmm. about it. Um, I don't think that you can process it while you're going through it, like fully process it. But I do think that it it keeps the valve open so you don't combust. Mm-hmm. And I do think that that was really key when we were going through it um, the first time. That helped with, you know, just... Mark is an optimist and I'm not, I'm more of a, just a realist. Mm-hmm. Like the glass just has half water. It's not half full or half empty. It just has like four ounces instead of yeah. eight. <laughs> so, you know, and it it's just good. Sometimes you don't want a solution. You just want to vent yeah. or you just want to cry. Um, and I talked to my sister a lot and, you know, so I have. Did you have moments? I'm sure you did, but did you have like some real serious moments of just falling apart during that time, those, that 18 months? I did not have them in front of the kids. I don't even think I had them in front of Mark, to be honest. Um, They mostly actually happened in my car. Was it out of more just exhaustion or of fear? Both. Um, Exhaustion is real. Mm -hmm. Nothing goes well when you're running on fumes and it's impossible to sleep in the hospital if for no other reason than just nerves Mm -hmm. uh, for me. Um, And uh, when she, whenever she was inpatient, whatever medicine she was on, she typically has to get checked at least once an hour. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, she, when we were just first, her body was first learning these treatments, we we're just in and out. It's just very chaotic. Yeah. Um, so it's not like there's a set time where you go to sleep and it's, you know, it's just not like that. Um, and then when you come home, it's all your home life. So mm-hmm. yeah, you're running on fumes. And I, I do think it was just that fear. So when I would let myself feel the fear, that's when I would truly break down. And it typically was when I was alone in the car. Um, yeah, just alone in the car or the shower. Those mm-hmm. are the two places I broke down the most. Because you, no one was going to come No one in. was there. Yeah. You know, it's just like, you. I needed a good cry. Yeah. I didn't want anybody to console me mm-hmm. really um, because I, you need to get it out, yeah. you know? And I there wasn't anything to do about it. I didn't think that there was anything wrong with doing it, but that's where I felt like the most alone was, you know, shower, closet, car. Yeah. Just kind of like when you're a regular mom and you want to say that goes back to like toddlerhood when you're just like, get away from me. I'm going in the shower. Yeah. You can't just, you know, you just need some peace and quiet. It's usually those are the places you find peace and quiet as a mom. And that still rings true. Um, You know, Five and a half years later, those are still my main locations for breaking down. Yeah, I think um, they might always be. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, during that 18 months, how many surgeries did she have? She had four. Um, 
to to try to remove the tumor? She only had one tumor resection. So they she did a biopsy just to get a tumor sample um, to see the, you know, there's different types, you know, there's kind of like offshoots. I don't mm-hmm. know the, the technical term, but, you know, there's different uh, types of things that they can look for in neuroblastoma that may or may not call, you know, change the course of protocol, you know, the, so they just wanted to biopsy the tumor to kind of get the, see the exact malignancy. Um, she had a port placed for her treatment. Um, then she had the tumor resection and then, um, she also had to have a different type of central line placed when, so they took out a port. And then when she was getting ready to do her transplants, they needed, they had to have so much uh, medicine going in to her that they couldn't just use one port. They needed, it, it's called a double lumen Hickman, but it's basically like two lines instead mm-hmm. of one. And so she had that surgery and then surgery to remove everything, the port and the... So going in up to that 18 month mark of the end of treatment, are you feeling optimistic that like, how do you, when you get to the 18 month mark, are you like, okay, is she cured or not? Or so how are you going into So all along the way that? they scan her um, mm-hmm. for progress. And so up until that point, her she was making progress and it was working. Actually, it worked so well the first month that she got a compression fracture in her back because the chemo shrunk the tumor so quickly mm-hmm. that it essentially broke her back. Wow. <laughs> um, I think I knew that. But the body's awesome and ribs were holding up the compression um, and she never needed anything other than just to monitor it. Um, and we're way, way past that now. So it's stable. But um, yeah, so they scanned continuously to check progress all along the way. Very thorough. Um, everything's very thorough. So we knew at every step, like she still has evidence of disease, but it's, you know, it, it was in her bone marrow, uh, 90, 95% in her bone marrow. And we knew those numbers were going down, but it was not until literally the last scan, the last possible opportunity um, We wanted to get her, the end goal was to get to these 18 months and to get her disease evidence, no evidence of disease so that we could get her on this clinical trial, which at that point had shown the best um, rate of not relapsing and kind of like our best hope. But you have to- Was there a high risk of relapse? Yes. So neuroblastoma is a very high risk Mm. of relapse. Um, It- doesn't have a high survivability, statistically does not have a high survivability rate at the age and stage that she was. Um, And then relapse is also very high, but this medicine was very promising, the most promising thing that they had. And it was being offered at Vanderbilt, but the, you had to be no evidence of disease in order to get on it. So are you like waiting for that to come back? Because at that, we, the last scan, they were like, uh, still a little bit. Oh. <laughs> so it was just like, please let this just be disease free so she can get on this clinical trial. And she was. And so, are you at that moment? Are Because, you know, I think people would think you must be like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is, were you like that or were you still just so cautious? I'm still very subdued about scans. Um, it's called scansiety. I don't that's, think it's a technical term. I don't know but that's a word, yeah. I don't think it's a technical term, but in the- <laughs> but in You the, can in make the, it up, you have the, it. In the uh, cancer world, whoever gets scans, I've heard it in adult cancer and pediatric, mm-hmm. um, but it's called scansiety. So it's the anxiety around scans. Um, and it's very real, especially leading up to it. And then again, like, you know, true to our way of processing, yeah. Mark's like, yes, like she's oh, he's so like she's cured, grateful, yes. so relieved, yeah. oh, and I'm like, he's so okay. optimistic. All right, for one millisecond, good. She doesn't have cancer like right this second, as of like ten minutes ago. Yeah. But like, yeah. you don't know. But no, I mean, we were we were so happy. I do remember we were so happy because we knew we could get on the clinical trial. Um, we actually went to Andrew's school and picked him up early. Uh, and we, you know, we were just were celebrating and we went out as a family and it was incredible. Then we threw um, a little, mm-hmm. you know, end of treatment and 
And I'm so nuanced. I was an English major and I didn't want to be like cancer free. So I called it the end of standard treatment protocol party. <laughs> and everyone's I, like, I'm going to a what? Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm like, the, I was so nuanced with the words that I use. Yeah. And I'm like, well, this is, we're just celebrating the end of treatment right. because you were still, still fearful has, to say it. Yes. And also because the clinical trial was two years long. So, so it's not it, like we were finished. Did the know? trial start right away? Immediately. Um, within two weeks. So you have to start the trial, uh, and because it's a clinical trial, they there are so many things that have to be exact or within a certain window. So she had to, you know, get all of this stuff completed within mm -hmm. two week window, start the clinical trial, which she did, and then it's also very regimented after that. So you go and, you know, you get the medicine once a month, you to have a checkup, lab work. And they're sending everything to a research lab. And hopefully it'll be FDA approved soon. I'm um, still not yet, but hopefully it will be soon. Okay. Um, and then scans every three months. So I that, that time, you know, you're kind of like, all right, we made it, you know, and it's clear. And she it's was going clear. back to school. And she went back to school. She actually, yes. So she was in, she's young. Her birthday's in July. So she was either going to be the youngest or the oldest. Yeah. So we actually had her start do kindergarten again. Mm -hmm. So she, the first year she was in treatment, she did homebound school, um, but she couldn't read. And I didn't want her to be in um, school all summer learning. I'm like, the girl's yeah. been through enough. Let her right. just do kindergarten over. Yeah. Have a fun summer and start <laughs> over again and go to kindergarten. Um, so she did. And it was it was the best choice. It was awesome. Um, so she went to kindergarten. She was in school. You basically live a normal life for lack of a better term because nothing's really normal after right. this happens. Did you feel like people were saying, oh my gosh, you must be so happy. Or, yes. Are you not so relieved? Like, yeah. Everything is amazing. This is look, like everything that you've dreamed and you've prayed mm -hmm. for. But were you feeling that on the inside? I, I did. And in hindsight, I knew it always felt weird to me, mm -hmm. but I couldn't really put... Um, like a word to it. And I felt like I was doing something wrong because I wasn't feeling like how everyone else was feeling. So right. I thought something was wrong with me because I'm like, why can't I just be so excited? Like everyone else, like yeah. we made it through 18 months. She's in school. Like, why am I not jumping, you know, on the rooftops shouting yeah. happiness? And, um, Part of it is, I think this is my personality. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you could tell me the best news. I'm like, oh, cool. Right. Um, but also it's because I now know that what my body was doing was it then started processing the last 18 months. Mm. And so I was just then remembering kind of what happened and remembering like, oh my God, I can't believe we lived in the hospital for a month during transplant. I can't believe she warm coated multiple times. Like I can't believe she was in the ICU. I just like, I kept having this loop of, I can't believe we did that. Right. Like PTSD. Which, for sure. It was definitely that. Um, and, and I knew, and like I said, like luckily I had mental health professionals walking with me down this path. So I knew what it was and I was talking to people about it, but I still um, still felt like, what's wrong with me? There's something wrong with me because I wasn't feeling like everyone else. But my way to deal with that was um, let's get things back to normal as soon as possible. Yeah. So I gave, I, I gave myself time to, you know, process this. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to just, she did her make a wish. Um, and then I was like, I'll just take a couple weeks off and, or a couple months off. And then when they go back to school, I'm going to look for a job. And I thought a couple months would be enough time to just, you know, wrap this up in a nice yeah, little get bow back to and life. I'm all finished with cancer uh -huh. and I'm going to go back to my life. And it mostly worked out like that, to be honest. Like I was able to get a job. Mm -hmm. um, I went back to work full time. The kids were in sports. Mark was working. Life was back to normal, but in the background and in my mind and in my body, it was like really PTSD all the time. 